Listeners, beware. This podcast contains themes of the macabre and does not shy away from the details. Our content is graphic and our language is colorful. We might not be your cup of tea, so listener discretion is strongly advised. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 12 of The Killer T. On today's episode, we will be discussing Robert, Robert William, Robert, William Pickton, 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 the Pick Farm, the pick killer. farm killer. We are your hosts, Chelsea and Christina. Welcome! Welcome back to yet another episode of The Bullshit, where we talk about really uncomfortable things and murder and life's many disappointments. <sighs> I feel like we're on a roll here with the gross, nasty every killers. Every single week, it is just our personal goal to make everyone vomit with how disgusting human beings can be sometimes. This episode definitely needs a trigger warning. So if rape, sexual assault, and cannibalism freak you out, this isn't your episode, and we'll see you in the next one. See ya in the next episode. All right, y'all. Chelsea? Would you like to set the scene? Do you want me to set the scene? I can set the scene. That's fine. Okay, let's let's talk about this motherfucker. Robert Willie Pickton was born on October 24th, 1949 in Port Coquitlam, British Columbia to Leonard and Louise Pickton. Willie's father, Leonard, was born in England and was a British immigrant to Canada by the age of three. His mother, Louise, was six years younger than Leonard and was a Canadian native. Okay, real quick, I've heard that she was six years younger, and I've heard that she was 16 years younger. Oh. There's, it's gone back and forth, Hmm. so. You think they'd be able to get that right? She was much younger. We'll we'll just go with that. Leonard had inherited his immigrant parents' property, and he stayed on that farm because he pretty much enjoyed the manual labor, but he was also kind of known throughout the community as being somewhat unambitious and lazy. He didn't even really pay that much attention to the women folk and pretty much remained a bachelor well into the 1940s. And so that's putting him in his actual 40s of no girlfriends, no wife, just doing shit around the farms. It was kind of unusual. What's wrong with you, bro? (laughs) Especially for that time period, honestly. Oh, for real. However, one day... He just shocks his entire family by announcing to them that he was engaged to the much younger woman that he met in a coffee shop, Helen Louise Pickton. She's actually going to go by the name Louise for Mm -hmm. this, but her name is Helen Louise Pickton. Willie was the middle child, and his birth was described as a difficult one with the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck. Because of this, some of his family did wonder if he had any brain damage, but the claim was never investigated. Interestingly enough, he did seem to have an impressive memory, recalling memories from as early as the age of two about gathering water from a spring under the floorboards of a chicken coop that was his bedroom. I have heard it described as he was very clingy to his mother Mm -hmm. and very needy. As middle children tend to be. Yes. (laughs) What they did was convert this chicken coop to keep him close to them, I I don't know. That's just what was described Seems in some a of the weird research. place to keep your toddler. Yeah, we're gonna see that these parents aren't the most vigilant, or diligent, <laughs> or loving, or caring. <laughs> but it's fine. It's fine. Go on. Tell me more. <laughs> this chicken coop had the only running water in Leonard and Louise's home, so that's fucking weird. And it's in the 19, like, 40s, 50s, 
Well, yeah, he was born in 49. Yeah. So this would have been the early 50s. They so, should have like, had the running world water has in their been home. Modernized. Yeah. The farm itself was described by one neighbor as being composed of junk and garbage, shack after shack, with animals and their feces everywhere. The Pictons are known throughout the entire community as being disgusting. Yeah. They are not farmers of fields and corn and those sort of things. They are livestock and pig farmers. But they also allow those animals to traverse in their personal living space. The house is literally filled with manure because Luis would just let the cows, pigs, chickens, ducks just walk in and live amongst them. When he was three years old, his father left him alone in the family's work truck. There was some pigs in the back of the truck that something needed adjusted, so he left the three-year-old toddler in the front seat with the truck running to go handle some of the stuff with the pigs in the back. And the three-year-old is like, ooh, look at all this fun stuff, and starts playing around and accidentally puts the truck into gear, which then hurtles down the, the road and crashes into a telephone pole. And ultimately, Willie is okay. It doesn't mention anything about if any of the animals were hurt or injured or anything, but he describes his father beating the living daylights out of him for this because, of course, the father blames and punishes the toddler that he left alone in the car while it was running. The three-year-old. That yeah. makes perfect sense. Makes total sense. The truck ended up being completely totaled and, you know, they were poor. So it was a really big deal, but again, not the fucking fault of the three-year-old. No. And Willie actually has a quote concerning that incident. And he says, I turn around and the truck started rolling. The pigs all start jumping off and my dad's <laughs> running behind the pigs trying to holler to stop the truck. I didn't know what to do. So I smashed it right into a telephone pole, totaled the truck right out. I sure got the hell beaten out of me, but that's what happens. I think the end of that quote is telling because it doesn't sound as if he is holding any animosity towards his dad. He's just saying, well, like, you know, that's what happens. Yeah. Like, almost like he was taking responsibility for it. I just found that interesting. A year later, Louise caught Willie smoking a cigarette, which, I mean, that's kind of impressive. I can't even imagine being four years old and being like, I'm going to smoke a cigarette. One of them had to be smoking. So yeah. he must have saw it and was just reenacting what they were doing. Exactly. But Louise thought the reasonable thing to do was to shove a cigar down his throat and make him smoke it as a punishment. And Willie justifies this later and says, well, the punishment worked. I didn't smoke for years and years and years later. It's mind blowing to me that this is the rationale of his parents for disciplining a toddler. Yeah. It's apparent that living conditions were not great in the Picton family. There wasn't a lot of items to go around. So a lot of them would wear hand-me-downs or homemade clothes. And Willie and his siblings wouldn't even bathe all that frequently. Like bathing was pretty scarce. Good hygiene was not something the Pictons were known for and sometimes washed as little as once a week or less. And they were teased around town by other children for their smell, with Leonard even being called Piggy. Apparently, Leonard didn't, it didn't really bother him what other people thought. He didn't care that they called him Piggy, but it bothered the children immensely. And weirdly enough, Willie had this bizarre fear of showers. I feel like there's a lot missing here because yeah. how does a child get afraid of a shower? So he would only allow himself to be bathed in a tub. And he says that he was afraid of the showers because his mom insisted that he only bathe in a tub. I don't buy that. It, it sounds yeah, that odd. Yeah, sound, something sounds really weird there. Even all the way fast forwarding into his adulthood, he wouldn't shower. He would take a bath in a tub. That was the only way that he cleaned himself. A retired Port Coquitlam welder who had once worked on some of the vehicles on the farm for the Picton family told a journalist much later on in life whenever Willie would be going to trial that he had heard stories of Leonard's violent abuse and aggressions towards Willie. However, the sister, the brother would say that while their dad wasn't really close with any of them, Willie was just always super close to his mom. And she's, the sister, Linda, didn't have anything really bad to say about her father. So 
you know, there's going to be a lot of hearsay in this Mm -hmm. because, again, these are recounts from the serial killer himself, his family. At least there's some community around them, but very small rural town. Bad gas travels fast in a small town. Yep, you get the idea. Picton learned animal husbandry and butchering from his father, who he said was always on the go keeping the farm up. He's learning how to do all of this as a very small child. So he is learning how to butcher an animal. And we're talking pig farm pigs. So these are massive Massive. animals. Like hundreds of pounds, massive animals. There has been some research done into the effects that the trade of butchering has on people's psychology. Mm -hmm. And oddly enough, they found that communities centered around butchering farms Mm -hmm. tend to have a higher rate of violence and drugs and crime. But it makes sense when you become desensitized to Mm -hmm. killing even an animal. I mean, serial killers in general, if you look at them, they normally start out killing animals. And I grew up in a hunting family. Mm -hmm. I've seen deer and, and squirrels and other stuff that have been gutted, but... There was something very different about that process than what I would imagine butchering. And obviously, if it's a perfectly honorable trade, people oh, have to do it. They make our world go around. But also, I don't know if it's great for a child. Wouldn't that start to introduce you to, like, disassociation? Well, of course. That's what I mean. Like, it would desensitize you to killing another creature at a young age when your brain is still making these neural pathways and And learning how to accept different things most children are inherently more drawn to animals as like a comfort and loving Mm -hmm. relationship so i could only imagine that has to be difficult and i don't i don't want to like cast a bad light on it because butchering is very important there are families than farmers that have to do that and it is perfectly normal i just don't know if introducing a very small child to it is the best I don't know. I mean, I could see teaching them about it and the necessity of it, but actually having them do it, I don't know. And the I don't animal know. husbandry thing is really interesting, yeah. too, because we're I don't... talking about some. Um, that would be kind of his first introduction to sex. I mean, and we can't really say much about butchering because, you know, we are not butchers and we're not farmers. My feelings are like a... Anyways, so to talk a little bit more about Leonard's relationship with Willie, because this was kind of a thing that they did together. Mm -hmm. Leonard was really emotionally closed off. He wasn't available and he was very, very busy. He was a workaholic. Well, he was quiet too, so he wasn't much of a talker. Willie would go on to say that he never really talked to his dad very much and that they did fight. But he was always closer to his mother, which is backed up by what his sister and his brother did say. Louise was a very unusual character. She was described by pretty much everyone in the community as being very eccentric. And I think that was a very polite way of describing her. She had very, very poor hygiene. And that was made to be a a very prominent description of her. That Mm -hmm. she had like no teeth and whatever she did have was rotting out of her mouth. She was described also as having very thin hair that was falling out of the top of her head. And she would wear a little cap to kind of cover it up, but it was just, like, fraying everywhere. And then she had a unusual amount of facial hair, which there's nothing wrong with that. It's natural. It happens. But she allowed it to kind of grow out into a little bit of a goatee. So as you can imagine, kids were not exactly very kind. No. And they bullied all three children tremendously for their outward appearances. Oftentimes, people would say that you couldn't even tell their mother and father apart because they wore the same clothes. Only sometimes Louise would wear her dress over her husband's jeans, and they were always covered in blood because they were butchering the animals, and they were always dirty, and they always smelled like shit. There's just no nice way to (laughs) describe this. I'm so sorry. No. No. Louise rarely wore any shoes other than a pair of men's thick rubber gum boots. I like rain boots, muck boots. And then one of their old neighbors described her 
as waddling like a duck. To be fair. To be fair. Leonard wasn't much better. He would wear dirty jeans and tattered t-shirts, and two of Luis's children, Linda and Dave, who were more round-faced and short, resembled her, while Willie was tall and narrow-faced with a long pointed nose who looked more like his father, and people used to say he was rat-faced. We're not I'm not laughing at them. It's just like I feel so awful describing another human being like I this. I know. Leonard and Louise never used to read to their children. Mm-hmm. More or less, their number one priority was using their children for as, manual labor. Yeah, manual, free manual labor. And they weren't really all that concerned with their education. If anything, it was more of an inconvenience because Louise was the matriarch and she wanted the kids there working all the time, Mm -hmm. but they did have to go to public school. And while they were there, they were bullied endlessly because they smelled so bad and they looked so bad. And in the area that they had lived in, a new hospital had been built. Mm -hmm. So where there was all kinds of doctors and nurses and their children were coming in and they made good money. And so the the class imbalance was very apparent. Mm -hmm. So there was very few children that were as poorly off as the Pictons compared to the wealthy children of the frickin' doctors that they were going to school with. And it didn't help that Willie was not very good at school. He pretty much consistently scored low on standardized tests, which mostly involve reading comprehension, and was held back once or twice before eventually being put into the class for quote-unquote slow children. Yes, he was put into a special ed class. It was said that when Willie wanted to hide from people, he would crawl into the carcasses of the gutted hogs. (laughs) I can't even touch on that one. (laughs) Like, who looks at that and is like, you know, this is my safe place. (laughs) At the age of 12, Willie had made a best friend in his pet, a young calf. He loved the animal always played with it, and even claimed to have longed to sleep with it. Like, I think he meant like lay and cuddle, lay and, and, cuddle and yeah, sleep. Like you would sleep with your dog in the bed. Yes. He would tell anyone he could about his little friend, and it was very apparent that Willie loved her. I wanted to keep that calf for the rest of my life, he is quoted as saying. One day, though, after returning home from school, he couldn't find her anywhere. So he's pretty desperate, begs his father to tell him where his pet is, and his father's reply was to look in the barn. This horrified Willie because he knew that's where his father killed all the animals. Ultimately, he did go and saw his precious pet hanging and gutted. And this is a very traumatizing sticking point for him. Let's just try and dissect this a little bit. Okay. What gets me is Willie saved up that money himself to get the calf. Like, he bought it to be his pet. Mm Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, his parents take his pet that he paid for and butcher it, knowing that he is in love with it and that it would hurt him. And then instead of being straightforward, they say, go look in the barn. Right. I mean, they didn't even prepare him for it. And then to top it off. What's their spiel here? What are they? Why? I don't know. And then to top it off. He's so distraught that he won't even speak to his family. And his mother, to basically appease him, goes, here's $20. Go buy another calf. Do you want to know how you get a serial killer? This is how. This is how. Remember in in our bonus episode when we were talking about people don't want to talk about the trauma they caused to their kids when raising them? Here it is. Here you go, guys. So all this happens, and all that he can think to say to his mom is, no, that was my calf. I want her. I don't want another calf. And this is a lesson that his parents teach him. It's almost like they're teaching him not to get close to something. Mm -hmm. And he does learn the. he now has object permanence of Mm -hmm. things in his life that, you know, you can come home one day and something that you love more than anything can just be gone. Right. And it's very, if he's still talking about this as an adult, you can tell that this is definitely something that has stayed with him for the entirety of his life. 
Definitely. He ends up dropping out of school in 1963 or 1964. This is around the age of 14. Again, this is not very unusual for this time period. People drop out of school all the time. He had done a little blue collar work education programs while at school and continued those a little bit after leaving. And he started to work as a meat cutter and did that for the better part of seven years before ultimately quitting and returning to the family farm. Apparently this was at some assistance of his mother that she really wanted him to learn the professional butchering trade and he had become actually an apprentice to this meat cutter. She looked at this as a way to for him to specialize in the trade that they already focused on. Right. It wasn't necessarily something that he was crazy about, but... He did love manual labor his entire life. Farming was his thing. Yeah. And he wasn't exactly very ambitious anyways. No. This was a job that he knew how to do and I guess did it well. There is no mentions of animal torture in his life. And I guess you could argue and say that all of this stuff, I mean, especially if you're vegan, you're going to say this is animal torture. But... It's not him willfully inf- inflicting pain upon innocent animals and enjoying No, we're it. not talking about him torturing cats or torturing dogs or anything like that. No, the only killing he is doing is the butchering. There was no mention of bedwetting. He wasn't known to be violent or have violent outbursts. He wasn't, he was very quiet and well-mannered and he kept to himself. There wasn't any mention of violence from him pretty much whatsoever. No, no mentions of bizarre sexual fantasies or any sexual sexual abuse. abuse. I mean, we could argue that there was probably some physical and mental abuse in the family, Mm -hmm. but that's also pretty standard with the times that we're talking about too. I mean, he did have a lower IQ ish his full general IQ was 86 so that puts him well above the level of mental retardation which is below 70 but I mean he's like on the low side of average Mm -hmm. Willie was considered to be a sweet quiet unassuming boy for pretty much the entirety of his young life and normally with serial killers we see them fitting into that McDonald's triad that we've talked about before which is animal torture, bedwetting, and arson. And we're not seeing any of that here with him. It's very fascinating because, boy, is it a turn later on in life. But before we even talk about what he does later on in life, we've come to this horrific family secret that unfolds. So in 1967, days before Willie's 18th birthday, His brother David accidentally killed a boy, and their mother and father actually fucking covered it up. Yeah, this is a really fucked up story. So David is the youngest, right? He's the the youngest of the Picton children, and he had just gotten his driver's license and had borrowed the family's truck. It was dark, and when David was driving home, he somehow plowed into a 14-year-old boy walking on the side of the road. The boy's bloodied body was crumpled on the ground and badly injured, but he wasn't dead. In a panic, Dave goes home and tells his mother. Luis immediately went out to where the boy was and rolled his body into the swamp, leaving him there to drown in the shallow water. So this boy is not dead. But she kills him, effectively, by rolling him into the dirt and the muck and letting him drown i okay first of all david's first response wasn't to go to authorities he's 16 i can see maybe sheer panic he runs home to mommy and doesn't know what to do but instead of mom and dad calling the authorities they go to cover this up for their precious baby i can't believe this mother sees a boy that's two years younger than her baby sees him crumpled on the ground and rolls him into the fucking that just blows my ever loving mind and then the kid had only been living there for a month his parents were immigrants they had just started this new life in canada so desperate to cover up what had happened dave 
takes the truck home and he tries to clean up all the blood and everything that's mm-hmm. on it and he notices there's more permanent damage done to the car which is it's missing paint and it's got some dents and stuff in the late hours of the night because mind you this happened around 8 p.m he calls the family mechanic and is like i need you to fix this right now yeah. and the, me- the mechanic's like okay so he brings the truck over and David is shaking and is very unusual behaviors, all kinds of stuff. And so he ultimately refuses to paint the truck or do much to it. Mm -hmm. And it sticks out like a sore thumb to him that something is clearly fucking going on. Meanwhile, the boy's family is frantic, trying to figure out what happened to their son. And his father ends up finding his body the very next day. They have an autopsy done that showed that the cause of death was drowning and not the injuries he had suffered when the truck hit him. The injuries were significant and pretty apparent as to what had happened. He'd suffered a fractured skull with a subcranial hemorrhage and a fractured dislocated pelvis, but the pathologist who did the autopsy stated that these injuries wouldn't have killed him. He would have just needed extreme medical care. So that same mechanic hears on the radio the next day that a 14 year old boy had been run over and killed and he automatically goes oh i know what the fuck happened he reports the pictons to the police Mm -hmm. now it gets fucking crazy because the parents say they're gonna take care of it and the case was seen before a coroner's jury and somehow was ruled as accidental With Dave only going to juvenile court, nothing happened to his mother. He spent no time in prison, and it was almost like it just got thrown out after the parents had said that they were going to handle it. Right. The fact that there was a criminal trial against the 16-year-old brother and not against the mother who actually killed the child. Mm -hmm. She's the one that, I mean, he may have done a hit and run. That wouldn't have killed the kid. No, if they had just called an ambulance then it would have been ruled as an accident and Dave probably would have gotten the same punishment as he already did, but then a child wouldn't have been dead. I will say that the truth of Luis's role in the child's death did get out into the community and she was treated with scorn pretty much from there on out. She was basically shunned. I have heard that David was known to be a partier. And I wonder if the mysterious reason why he accidentally hit this boy... Is because he was drunk. I'm sure he was. And maybe that also played into why they ruled it as... Accidental. A- accidental. But because he was a juvenile, we couldn't... I can't get those records. Yeah. Moving on from this tragic accident... Incident. Uh, it's an accident, but it's an incident. Willie developed long-distance relationships with people. And I say relationships because not all of them were romantic, but they were all female. And he started doing, like, pen pals. Right. He lives in this... First of all, we haven't even talked about how fucking isolated this man must be. He lives oh, in, he's in the middle of fucking nowhere. Yeah, British on this Columbia, giant farm. Being scorned from his entire yeah, community nobody likes him. him. Nobody wants to be around him because he smells like poop. Like, this kid probably has some serious isolation problems, so no wonder he turns to writing and being pen pals with people in order to form some sort of connection, because that's, like, the safest safest option for him. Oh, definitely. So from time to time, as he was an adult, he would actually travel to the United States to meet some of these pen pals. One of them was named Connie Anderson, who he would later go to Michigan and spend five weeks with and ultimately fell in love with her and at the end of his stay there he proposed however mommy called he needed to go back to canada to help on the farm and connie was supposed to meet him back up there but she refused to live the farm life right ultimately it never happened they they never became intimate with each other in those five weeks that they were there I'm not sure if he's a virgin or not at this point in time. That was his only real love connection, and it fizzled out before it even started, really. Right. Luis ends up dying of cancer when Willie was in his late 20s, about two years after his father had died. Following their death, the three children inherited the farm. And in the late 1970s, the three siblings went from extremely poor to fairly well off and very quickly 
the government came in and started trying to buy up their property for highways and they started sectioning bits off to sell to developers. So they're taking this piece of land that they've inherited and are banking on it, essentially. Could you imagine going from having no running water to all of a sudden the government is buying up tons of your land to put highways on and developers want it? I mean, they... I'm not saying that they became rich, but maybe they did. Willie starts working with pigs, which no surprise there. This is what he's been raised to do. He ends up building up his barns and driving a truck for BC Hydro until his quote unquote piggery burned down in 1978. Eventually, the Picton siblings did begin to neglect the remaining farm in the presence of their newfound wealth. Instead of getting the farm up and running properly, they decided to register a nonprofit charity called Piggy Palace Good Time Society. Let me say that again. Piggy Palace Good Time Society. They claim to organize events and functions on behalf of worthy groups like service organizations and sports organizations. But that's not what they were doing. You don't say. This was a place for lurid sex fantasies and prostitutes and drugs and allegedly even the Hells Angels to come and hang out and have orgies. And that part is all fucking true. Okay, so let me explain this a little bit here. Just just a little bit. It's not all three siblings who are invested. It's mostly Dave and Willie. Yes. The sister around the age of like 12 or 13, she had had enough and actually went to move in with more civilized family folk, not in the middle of manure fields. I don't want to do this anymore. So she really didn't have a lot of strong relationships with her parents and even with her brothers. A lot of her memories and stuff comes from those first 12 years spent with them. But she did inherit property and money and all that stuff and did have somewhat of a say so. But she's gone on and and her life has developed elsewhere outside of them. So it's really just the two brothers who decide to go into business together with this Piggy Place Good Time Society, but also doing construction, having a salvage yard. There's legitimate businesses that do happen and they do fairly well. Right. However, this Piggy Palace Good Time Society is just a... It's a front. It's a lot of debauchery. For all kinds of illegal activity. So the Pictons would sell liquor at these little parties that they would have and charge a entrance fee to raise money all of this was done illegally and there's very very little evidence to suggest that there any of this money was actually used for any sort of fundraising or put to any credible good whatsoever but dave had become rather famous in the area for hosting these parties like if you wanted to have a good time you went and saw dave at the piggy palace (laughs) meanwhile willie was just kind of there he really wasn't like all that interested in the parties he would go and have a good time but he wasn't as social as what dave was this place allegedly could hold anywhere from 1700 to 2000 well i mean it's a pig farm of course supposedly that's how big some of these I guess we're going to call them raves, would kind of be. Oh, God. It's just, listen, it's the 70s going into the 80s. Shit's wild. (laughs) Shit's wild. (laughs) But on a much more serious note, this is going to be Willie's introduction to sex workers. Yes. And I'm assuming around this time is where the darker side of Willie kind of blossoms. The brothers each become successful business owners in their own right. Their workhorses and neighbors claimed that it wasn't unusual for Willie to be seen working up to 18 hours a day. He lived alone in a trailer on the farm and never built a real house with any of the money that he earned, which... Supposedly he had like this big elaborate plan for a gigantic house with a cast iron spiral staircase. It just never happened. No. He never ends up having a girlfriend either. And he claims it was because he never wanted to be held down. But one does wonder if there was more to it than that. I will say that Willie was a bit of a sucker. 
Yeah. So even though we ultimately know what he became, before this, he gets all this money and suddenly people, people like him. Like him. He's getting attention. They want to spend time with him. I mean, he does have kind of an average, a little bit lower intelligence. I would think that he knew that they were only smoozing him to try and get handouts. But or get into these parties. Maybe he didn't. However, more people started coming around with their hands held out ready yeah. for... I think it's important to note at this point that most of his sexual experiences are with sex workers. His entire life is revolving around being a pig farmer and he doesn't have girlfriends, so he's using sex workers to fill that void. And we don't really know of a specific first experience. I mean, there's not a lot there. I would assume that he's so socially awkward that when he discovered the red light district in Canada, Mm -hmm. well, not just Canada, where he's based in Canada, that it probably sparked a light bulb and that just paying someone for sex was probably much easier than actually trying to make a real human connection because again he doesn't have any of those he has no real emotional or physical connection to anyone other than his mother and his brother right he actually prided himself on his manual labor and relished telling stories about farm work and the dangerous experiences he had with wild animals he once said that he was chased by a black bear as a teen and mauled by an angus bull i mean bulls are notorious for being complete and utter (laughs) assholes so but these are stories that he loves recanting to anyone that will listen yeah He was seriously injured while trying to break up two boars that were fighting as he tried to breed a large sow in heat. Picton says he failed to lock the pen and the two males started to fight. And they were going to kill each other, he recalls. I got in between them and then they went after me. My question is, when did the... I feel like maybe whenever he got introduced to prostitutes that that like the darkness started to boil over him. I don't know. They say that he could have started killing in somewhere around 1978 and then others say it wasn't until the 1990s. I don't know because up until this point like I get him being socially awkward. He's just at this point he's just a socially awkward pig farmer. Yeah. Who? Where his entire identity is wrapped around manual labor and being a farmer. Right. I'm not. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And he wasn't all that interested in drugs or alcohol too, by the way. No, that was his more of his brother's gig. So it's kind of bizarre to me that this happens. Yeah, there are signs of abuse and he had a really hard life, but he seems like he would be more of the tough Knox kind of guy him becoming a serial killer while yes there's a lot of trauma the him snapping i mean i don't was it just a thrill i don't know i'm kind of baffled by him a bare minimum of 65 women disappeared from picton's preferred vancouver hunting grounds now this is the red light district that i'm talking about these women disappeared between the uh, the years 1978 and 2001 So this is why I say that he could have started killing around 1978. Again, when you have prostitutes and drug addicts and runaways and disenfranchised women doing what they have to do in order to make a living, oftentimes they are targets for violence, abuse, and trafficking and serial killers. Maybe it was him. Maybe it was was someone else. else. Who knows? Either way, he's connected to these women that are vanishing. Even after the largest investigation in Canadian serial killer history, it is still unknown who was actually Picton's first murder. And honestly, I couldn't find anything where he knew what his first murder was. No. But he did used to troll the downtown east side district of Vancouver. And surprise, surprise... Willie picked women who are minority, indigenous women, sex workers, drug addicts, runaways, anyone basically who wasn't connected to any family or was living on the fringes of society. We've talked about this before. We'll talk about it more in the future. Get ready. However, Picton intentionally familiarized himself with the area through frequent stops at a rendering plant located there. This is where he would dispose of animal waste parts. He then would cruise the 10 block strip called the low track searching for prey. He lured them away with promises of drugs or money, brought them to the farm, and then brutally murdered them. I almost wonder if he was maybe disgusted with them. I don't know. Or didn't like the drugs and the alcohol. I can't figure it out. Or maybe he just didn't want to pay for the sex. 
I don't Maybe he know. got tired of paying for it, so he just thought, I'll kill him instead? I mean, maybe that introduction to impregnating the animals yeah, and the butchering, maybe even though he hasn't talked about it openly in any interviews or something, that created his first correlation with sex and pleasure. I don't know. It's fucking bizarre. Like, what an incredible jump. You know what I mean? Yeah. In 1991, the families of missing women, along with many advocates for sex trade workers, established a annual Valentine's Day Remembrance Walk as a memorial to the missing and murdered indigenous victims. The public and families had realized there was this big jump in missing women, and no bodies were turning up. However, we involved the police the Vancouver Police Department, and they can't be fucking bothered. Literally, one of their sergeants goes on record stating that these disappearing women, they're either probably just going someplace else or they are overdosing. And realistically, that's better for everyone because it means it's not taking up too much of the police officer's time and their funding. This is what someone in a uniform actually fucking said about the women that they are supposed to protect and the justification is well they're prostitutes they're criminals (gasps) feelings of rage the police's obvious apathy drew a lot of scorn from the indigenous community and eventually the vancouver sun newspaper brought national attention to their lack of diligence in investigating the missing women no national inquiry would take place until 2016 so we just jumped from the 90s to 2016 yeah during all of this time willie is killing prostitutes and the cops are doing literally nothing about it. For those of you people who haven't heard of this, the missing murdered indigenous women is actually a gigantic issue in Mm -hmm. Canada. It's here in the United States as well, specifically on the West Coast. Canada seems to be worse. Yes. The Cree women in Canada go disappearing at alarming rates, and oftentimes nothing is done even when they are reported. And so these families of the missing murdered indigenous women have had to mobilize to actually get anything done. And literally- We're talking doing searches themselves. Yeah. Doing investigations themselves because the police just flat out will not do anything about it. And if it wasn't for social media, awareness around this issue- To be honest, I wouldn't have even known about it if it wasn't for TikTok. Yeah. I mean, we're talking, this is 2020. This man, this serial killer, his crimes causing these disappearances are what starts pushing momentum to start investigating what is going on. Right. That takes us to Diana Melnick. She was a young Canadian woman who disappeared in 1995 and is the earliest victim that police connected to Picton. She was 5 foot 2, 100 pounds, she was a partier and had last been seen at Willie's farm. Melnick's DNA would be found at several different locations throughout the Picton farm, though a search of the entire grounds would not turn up any of her remains. There wasn't enough evidence to charge Willie for her murder. Throughout Mm. the years, what he would do is Willie would lure unsuspecting women to his farm under the pretense of paying for sex. There, he would have sex with them before murdering them. He would strangle them with wire or shoot them, with no neighbors around to hear them scream. He would handcuff them, then bleed and gut them before feeding them to his pigs. Allegedly, he would grind up some of his victims into mincemeat, mix them with pork, and then sold the meat to unsuspecting people. It is said to have even possibly sold this meat to local police officers. However, the authorities have written this off as rumors and legend. But he had all the tools necessary to do that stuff. To be fair, I wouldn't be surprised if it is true and the police are just saying, no, 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 that never would have happened to cover up their absolute lack of any responsibility. He would have found that hilarious. His mother and his father kept gigantic freezers on the grounds. And he inherited those freezers. He upgraded those freezers because he was a butcher. It was cutting out the middleman for him and his farm workers to do all the butchering themselves and sell it on location rather than send it out to somebody else to handle all that stuff because that's what's typical 
of agriculture is that you you do all the harvesting and you send it out. Exactly. They didn't do that. So they had all the necessary tools. And you're going to tell me that he killed all these 60-some people, can't find any of their remains, yet there's DNA sprinkled out throughout the entire farm. Well, I mean, they weren't big on cleaning, so. You're going to tell me that he did not feed them to those motherfucking pigs and then somehow never got rid of those pigs? I don't believe that shit. No, I don't either. On March 22nd, 1997, a woman Picton had taken to the farm fought back. She grabbed a kitchen knife and fought like hell, resulting in both she and Willie receiving serious stab wounds. The woman managed to escape Picton and ran from the farm, waving down a car and calling the police. She was taken to the Royal Columbian Hospital in New Westminster. While the woman was undergoing emergency surgery, Picton was receiving treatment for his injuries in the same hospital. A hospital orderly did, in fact, find a key in his pocket that fit the handcuffs on the woman's wrist. Picton was arrested and charged with attempted murder, assault with a weapon, and forcible confinement. Did she get justice? Of course course not. not. I've also heard that she was a teenager, that she was like a young girl. And why didn't he get justice? Well, because the charges were eventually dropped. Because the victim was a drug addict and considered a incompetent witness. And Picton, in his loveliness, claimed she was a hitchhiker who had attacked him. Could you imagine being a teenage girl who got dealt a shitty hand in life and some dude tries to fucking murder you and rape you and you have all this physical evidence and nothing is done about it? This little girl literally fought for her life took off running down the street flagged somebody down and she's got handcuffs on how do you explain the handcuffs how is she not a competent how do you explain the handcuffs why give me a face because i need to punch it (laughs) like (sighs) in spring of 1999 a source reported to the police that a woman by the name of lynn ellingson had seen a woman's body hanging in the picton's slaughterhouse lynn initially denied this story but much later she recanted and said on march 20th that she had in fact seen the body but didn't report it because she feared picton and depended on him for money for drugs early 1999 bill hiscox while working for the pictons informed the rcmp that lisa yeld had told hiscox she had seen women's clothing purses and identification papers at the pig farm He believed these items were possessions of the missing women. Police questioned Yeld, but she did not want to cooperate. And so because of this, no search warrant could be issued. She didn't want to cooperate because they were friends. He was nice to her when she was five. Mm -hmm. Because of that, like 30 years later, they had some sort of really simple friendship. Right. Finally, in 2001, the Vancouver police formed Project Even-Handed, a joint task force to investigate the missing women. Women have been missing since 1978. You're a little late, guys. About 20 years too late. After authorities descended upon the property to execute the search warrant, the police would spend the next several weeks investigating the scene. And on February 22nd, 2002, they took Willie into custody on two counts of first-degree murder, for the deaths of Mona Wilson and Serena Abbotsway. He would be brought up on charges again on April 2nd for three more victims and charged again for a sixth on April 9th. Picton left very, very little evidence for police to collect because he fed his fucking victims to pigs and then sold the minced meat. Whereas if the police had just done their goddamn jobs and investigated the missing women, they may have been able to link them back to Willie Picton and then find more evidence on the farm before he could dispose of it all. So in a bizarre twist of fate, turn of events, whatever you want to fucking call it, Willie would unknowingly confess to his cellmate that was actually an undercover police officer. Mm -hmm. And boy, he just spills the motherfucking beans. Like, they've got him for six women And he's there just, like, spilling his guts. Oh, God. (laughs) 
But he's, yeah, metaphorically spilling his guts to this undercover police officer about how he really just wanted to hit that big 5-0 and he was so distraught that he only got to 49 women. He even went as far as saying that he would have stopped killing people at 50. Like, he just wanted to hit 50. Picton was angry and mad and so disappointed in himself that he only killed 49 women. What makes it even worse is that after officers withdrew the undercover cop who was posing as the cellmate, Picton strips Uh. naked and begins masturbating after having discussed all of these disgusting crimes that he had committed. What the fuck is wrong with him? Now we saw that with the last with Sam Little. That as he's recount, and this is common. That is, they're recounting their, they're I know. reliving it. I know, but ew, it, ew. No, it is, it is disgusting. And we could go over the trial, but the long and short of it is, out of the forty nine women, he gets charged with the murder of six of them and gets life in prison. There are some things that happen after this. For one, he writes his own memoir that gets smuggled out of prison and is actually publicized. It was on Amazon for the longest time, apparently, but it was known as The Butcher. Amazon eventually did take it down. What I have found in some of the research that I did and some of the other podcasts, one of our favorites being the Serial Killers podcast, I think they used that one for a lot of their information. Mm -hmm. But I opted to not include it in our research because a lot of it was hearsay. Right. No, there's been several times where we have used the serial killer's own recurrence of events to tell their story, but usually that's in the circumstance where they're working with a a journalist who can give kind of objective intervention and facts and, you know, kind of balance out the bias. I couldn't even get my hands on it anyways, but if I couldn't find information that was credible, I really tried to not include it in here. The man has created a lot of myth and legend and lore around what he did Mm -hmm. now however in 2020 due to genetic genealogy and advancements in forensic science and um all that stuff we now can test pigs for human dna so maybe don't use pigs if you're trying to get rid of that shitty abusive ex-boyfriend yes they'll find you and that does help you know if anybody gets any terrible ideas Y'all can't do that shit no more. I don't know, dude. (laughs) This guy is such a... He baffles me so much because there was no definitive, like, snap. Like, there was no snapping point. He just went from being a socially awkward, smelly, stinky pig farmer to raping and killing women. Where's... I'm, I'm I'm missing the connection here. What happened? Ultimately, you can find footage of him there are some interviews there was a film and an autobiography there's lots of stuff on him he's just a horrible piece of shit man that's the only that's how i'm summing up all right so dahmer scale um where are you on the jeffrey i'm gonna put i'm gonna give him a nine a nine we might not have, have had a lot of specific victims that we could go over the horrible things that they went through, but it's no far stretch of imagination to assume that that's pretty catastrophic. Yeah, yeah. He's a solid like eight and a half, nine for me. He just, the blatant lack of disregard for any victims. I feel like the serial killers that we talk about that show remorse, they like get lower on the scale for me. Because it's it like humanizes them a little bit, mm-hmm. but these guys that are just like, oh, I just needed one more to. Oh, he believed that he believed that he. The only reason why he got caught is because he got sloppy. He he literally told a police officer that he has no remorse. No. How do you go from this incredibly feeling child to this? And there has been some psychology and stuff done done on him. He does have problems with disassociation and isolation. And... Oh, you don't say. <laughs> but I don't really have a solid study that I can refer to on his own psychosis. Do we need a palate cleanser? We most certainly need a palate cleanser. Palate cleanser, this is a palate cleanser. Invited to Live on a Farm by Robert Picton. Jack the Ripper, Thought Exterminator. 
<laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> and you mean thought as in T-H-O-T. Yes. This is one of those little like series where it's Ted and Jeff. And it says, hey, Jeff, do you know what sucks about being a nephrophiliac? I don't know, Ted. What? Trying to get stiff before she does. Oh, God. When you're watching a true crime documentary and the suspicious husband says, I love my wife and I would never do anything to hurt her. And you're like, "Mm mm-hmm. I can think of so fucking many killers where they've gone on live TV and been like, I just want her to come home. Meanwhile, I've chopped her body and put her in like a silo. It's BTK and Ted. And he says, hey, Ted, what's the difference between 10 dead hookers and a Ferrari? What's that? I don't have a Ferrari in my garage. It's a picture of Dexter and it says, you're not a serial killer if you bring donuts. I'm DTF. Down to find out who killed John Benet Ramsey. <laughs> no, it's a my picture God. of Albert Finch. Oh, gross. Here's your having a baby. Shows up with a side dish and a bottle of wine. Oh, my in my sixth grade science class, a girl read orgasm instead of organism, and the class laughed and she was embarrassed. So to calm her down, her teacher was like, you're going to forget about this in two weeks. Nobody's going to remember it. I remember it, Danielle, and it's been nine years. <laughs> I hope you fucking see this. <laughs> uh, if you can't beat them, eat them. Jeffrey Dahmer. For me, the most shocking part of the Ted Bundy tapes was the fact that he lost 25 pounds in six days. Boomer. Nowadays, there's nothing but rage and violence. I'm glad I've grown up in the 70s. The 70s. And it's Bundy, (laughs) Son of Sam, Dahmer, (laughs) BTK, Kemper. (laughs) She loves eight serial killers all in the 70s. Get the fuck out of here. Here's some cult death for you. Why don't people tell many jokes about the Reverend Jim Jones? The punchline was too long. (laughs) Okay. I'm done. That's enough. That's enough. Fucking hell. All right, y'all. What did you think of our bonus episode? Was it fun? Yeah, y'all were exceptionally quiet about it. I mean, it's had almost 200 plays since we put it out a week ago have we scared you away was it too much debauchery but honestly no we are we are really looking for feedback because it's a different approach to what we normally do normally we're talking about serial killers we don't even just talk about one-off killers we talk specifically about serial killers so doing these little side bonus episodes is different for us yeah do you like it do you not like it do you like the interviews? Is the audio okay? Chelsea did a really good job on editing her first two episodes. Well, you know the drill. Oh, wait, before you do the drill, we have buttons and stickers. Yes, I forgot. Yes, we have other merch that isn't like a limited time offer yes. kind and of a deal. it's very affordable. Yes. $5 buttons, $5 stickers. Shipped to you. They're on our website. You can buy through PayPal, buy a button, buy a sticker, support your girls. Yes, we don't do any ad marketing. I mean, I'm not saying that we're never going to do it because your girl wants to make money. But we don't do any ad marketing right we now. We don't do a Patreon. Yep. Yeah. Everything is self-financed. All of our our laptops, microphones. We just got a whole new setup in my home studio. So that way we can kind of purify the audio. So it's better for you. We're trying to be better and more advanced. Crispy, fresh audio. Yes. So please give us some feedback. We love to hear from you guys. This is our hobby and you empower us to continue doing it. All right, y'all. You know the drill. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at The Killer T. Someday we may make a TikTok. I don't know. We'll see. It's just going to be a surprise. Will they do it? Won't they do it? What's the content going to be like? The world will never know. The world will never fucking know because we're never going to fucking post it. (laughs) No. (laughs) You can also visit us on our website, thekillertea.com. And as always, if you want to send us an email, you are most welcome to do so at thekillertea at gmail.com. 
All right, y'all. Until next time. Bye. Join us in the next episode where we discuss Belle Gunness, the Black the Widow, Black Widow of, Laporte. of Laporte. episode definitely deserves a trigger warning so here it is (laughs) 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 i think we actually did that one in unison yes bitch it only took us like 80 episodes (laughs) oh god 34 32 but okay whatevs whatevs Oh, I burped. It's fine. <laughs> Fucking pregnancy. I declare pregnancy! <laughs> <laughs> Can that, that should be my, like, gender announcement. <laughs> I declare pregnancy! Michael, you can't just declare bankruptcy. <laughs> Join us. No. Why am I happy? Join us in the next episode. Join us in the next episode where we talk about Bell fucking buttfuck. The buttfuckery of the buttfucks. I don't... What was your name again? Was that her moniker? I was close.